chapter seven of the old adam this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the old adam by arnold bennett chapter seven cornerstone one on a morning in spring edward henry got out of an express at euston which had come not from the five towns but from birmingham having on the previous day been called to birmingham on local and profitable business he had found it convenient to spend the night there and telegraph home that london had summoned him it was in this unostentatious this half furtive fashion that his visits to london now usually occurred not that he was afraid of his wife not that he was afraid even of his mother oh no he was merely rather afraid of himself of his own opinion concerning the metropolitan non-local speculative and perhaps unprofitable business to which he was committed the fact was that he could scarcely look his women in the face when he mentioned london he spoke vaguely of real estate enterprise and left it at that the women made no inquiries they too left it at that nevertheless the episode of wilkins was buried but it was imperfectly buried the five towns definitely knew that he had stayed at wilkins for a bet and that brindley had discharged the bet and rumors of his valet his electric brougham his theatrical supper parties had mysteriously hung in the streets of the five towns like a strange vapor wisps of the strange vapor had conceivably entered the precincts of his home but nobody ever referred to them nobody ever sniffed apprehensively nor asked anybody else whether there was not a smell of fire the discreetness of the silence was disconcerting happily his relations with that angel his wife were excellent she had carried angelicism so far as not to insist on the destruction of carlo and she had actually applauded while sticking to her white apron the sudden and startling extravagances of his toilet on the whole though little short of thirty-five thousand pounds would ultimately be involved not to speak of liability of nearly three thousand a year for sixty-four years for ground rent edward henry was not entirely gloomy as to his prospects he was indubitably thinner in girth novel problems and anxieties and the constant annoyance of being in complete technical ignorance of his job had removed some flesh and not a bad thing either but on the other hand his chin exhibited one proof that life was worth living and that he had discovered new faith in life and a new conviction of youthfulness he had shaved off his beard well sir a voice greeted him full of hope and cheer immediately his feet touched the platform it was the voice of mr marrier edward henry and mr marrier were now in regular relations before edward henry had paid his final bill at wilkins and relinquished his valet and his electric brougham and disposed forever of his mythical man on board the minnetonka and got his original luggage away from the hotel majestic mr marrier had visited him and made a certain proposition and such was the influence of mr marrier's incurable smile and of his solid optimism and of his obvious talent for getting things done on the spot as witness the photography that the proposition had been accepted mr marrier was now edward henry's representative in london at the green room club mr marrier informed reliable cronies that he was edward henry's confidential adviser at the turk's head hanbridge edward henry informed reliable cronies that mr marrier was a sort of clerk factotum or maid of all work a compromise between these two very different conceptions of mr marrier's position had been arrived at in the word representative the real truth was that edward henry employed mr marrier in order to listen to mr marrier he turned to mr marrier like a tap and nourished himself from a gushing stream of useful information concerning the theatrical world 
mr marrier quite unconsciously was bit by bit remedying edward henry's acute ignorance the question of wages had caused edward henry some apprehension he had learnt in a couple of days that a hundred pounds a week was a trifle on the stage he had soon heard of performers who worked for nominal salaries of forty and fifty a week for a manager twenty pounds a week seemed to be a usual figure but in the five towns three pounds a week is regarded as very goodish pay for any subordinate and edward henry could not rid himself all at once of native standards he had therefore with diffidence offered three pounds a week to the aristocratic marrier and mr marrier had not refused it nor ceased to smile on three pounds a week he haunted the best restaurants taxicabs and other resorts and his garb seemed always to be smarter than edward henry's especially in such details as waistcoat slips of course mr marrier had a taxicab waiting exactly opposite the coach from which edward henry descended it was just this kind of efficient attention that was gradually endearing him to his employer how goes it said edward henry curtly as they drove down to the grand babylon hotel now edward henry's regular headquarters in london said mr marrier i suppose you've seen another of em's got a knighthood no said edward henry who he knew that by m mr marrier meant the great race of actor managers gerald pompey something to do with him being a sheriff in the city you know i bet you what you ache he went in for the common council simply in order to get even with old pilgrim in fact i know he did and now a foundation stone laying has dan it a foundation stone laying yes the new city guild's building you know a royalty temple bar business sheriff's knighthood there you are oh said edward henry and then after a pause added pity we can't have a foundation stone laying by the way old pilgrims in the deuce and all of a uh, old oh, i hear it's all over the clubs in speaking of the clubs mr marrier always pronounced them with a capital letter i told you he was going to sail from tilbury on his world tour and have a grand embarking ceremony and seeing off just like him greatest advertiser the world ever saw well since that p and o boat was lost on the goodwins cora pride has absolutely declined to sail from tilbury absolutely swears she'll join the steamer at marseilles and pilgrim has got to go with her too why well even pilgrim couldn't have a grand embarking ceremony without his leading lady he's furious i hear why shouldn't he go with her why not because he's formally announced his grand embarking ceremony invitations are out barge from london bridge to tilbury and so on what he wants is a good excuse for giving it up he'd never be able to admit that he'd had to give it up because cora pride made him he wants to save his face well said edward henry absently it's a queer world you've got me a room at the grand bab rather then let's go and have a look at the regent first said edward henry no sooner had he expressed the wish than mr marrier's neck curved round through the window and with three words to the chauffeur he had deflected the course of the taxi edward henry had an almost boyish curiosity about his edifice he would go and give it a glance at the oddest moments and just now he had a swift and violent desire to behold it with all speed the taxi shot down shaftsbury avenue and swerved to the right there it was yes it really existed the incredible edifice of his caprice and of mr alloyd's constructive imagination it had already reached a height of fifteen feet and dozens of yards above that cranes dominated the sunlit air swinging loads of bricks in the azure and scores of workmen crawled about beneath these monsters and he edward henry by a single act of volition was the author of it he slipped from the taxi penetrated within the wall of hoardings and gazed just gazed 
a wondrous thing human enterprise and also a terrifying thing that building might be the tomb of his reputation on the other hand it might be the seed of a new renown compared to which the first would be as not he turned his eyes away in fear yes in fear i say he said will sir john pilgrim be out of bed yet do ye think he glanced at his watch the hour was about eleven he'll be at breakfast i'm going to see him then what's his address twenty-five queen anne's gate but do you know him i do shall i cam with you no said edward henry shortly you go on with my bags to the grand bab and get me another taxi i'll see you in my room at the hotel at a quarter to one eh rather agreed mr marrier submissive two sole proprietor of the regent theatre these were the words which edward henry wrote on a visiting card and which procured him immediate admittance to the unique spectacle reputed to be one of the most enthralling sights in london of sir john pilgrim at breakfast in a very spacious front room of his flat so celebrated for its gobelins tapestries and its truly wonderful parquet flooring sat sir john pilgrim at a large hexagonal mahogany table at one side of the table a small square of white diaper was arranged and on this square were an apparatus for boiling eggs another for making toast and a third for making coffee sir john with the assistance of a young chinaman and a fox terrier who flitted around him was indeed eating and drinking the vast remainder of the table was gleamingly bare save for newspapers and letters opened and unopened which sir john tossed about opposite to him sat a secretary whose fluffy hair neat white chemisette and tender years gave her an appearance of helpless fragility in front of the powerful and ruthless celebrity sir john's crimson socked left foot stuck out from the table emerging from the left half of a lovely new pair of brown trousers and resting on a piece of white paper before this white paper knelt a man in a frock coat who was drawing an outline on the paper round sir john's foot you are a bootmaker aren't you sir john was saying airily yes sir john excuse me said sir john i only wanted to be sure i fancied from the way you caressed my corn with that pencil that you might be an artist on one of the illustrated papers my mistake he was bending down then suddenly straightening himself he called across the room i say givington did you notice my pose then my expression as i used the word caressed how would that do and edward henry now observed in a corner of the room a man standing in front of an easel and sketching somewhat grossly thereon in charcoal this man said if you won't bother me sir john i won't bother you ah givington ah givington murmured sir john more airily at breakfast he was either airy or nothing you're getting on in the world you aren't merely an a r a you're making money a year ago you'd never have had the courage to address me in that tone well i sincerely congratulate you here snip here's my dentist's bill worry it worry it good dog worry it the dog growled now over a torn document beneath the table miss taft you might see that a communique goes out to the effect that i gave my first sitting to mr saracen givington a r a this morning the activities of mr saracen givington are of interest to the world and rightly so you'd better come round to the other side for the right foot mr bootmaker the journey is simply nothing and then and not till then did sir john pilgrim turn his large and handsome middle-aged blond face in the direction of elderman edward henry mac Hinn pardon my curiosity said sir john but who are you my name is mackin elderman mackin said edward henry i sent up my card and you asked me to come in ha sir john exclaimed seizing an egg will you crack an egg with me elderman i can crack an egg with anybody thanks said edward henry i'll be very glad to and he advanced towards the table sir john hesitated the fact was that though he dissembled his dismay with marked histrionic skill he was unquestionably overwhelmed by astonishment 
in the course of years he had airily invited hundreds of callers to crack an egg with him the joke was one of his favorites but nobody had ever ventured to accept the invitation chung he said weakly lay a cover for the elder man edward henry sat down quite close to sir john he could discern all the details of sir john's face and costume the tremendous celebrity was wearing a lounge suit somewhat like his own but instead of the coat he had a blue dressing jacket with crimson facings the sleeves ended in rather long wristbands which were unfastened the opal cufflinks drooping each from a single hole perhaps for the first time in his life edward henry intimately understood what idiosyncratic elegance was he could almost feel the emanating personality of sir john pilgrim and he was intimidated by it he was intimidated by its hardness its harshness its terrific egotism its utterly brazen quality sir john's glance was the most purely arrogant that edward henry had ever encountered it knew no reticence and edward henry thought when this chap dies he'll want to die in public with the reporters round his bed and a private secretary taking down messages this is rather a lark said sir john recovering it is said edward henry who now felicitously perceived that a lark it indeed was and ought to be treated as such it shall be a lark he said to himself sir john dictated a letter to miss taft and before the letter was finished the grinning chung had laid a place for edward henry and snip had inspected him and passed him for one of the right sort had i said that this is rather a lark sir john inquired the letter accomplished i forget said edward henry because i don't like to say the same thing twice over if i can help it it is a lark though isn't it undoubtedly said edward henry decapitating an egg i only hope that i'm not interrupting you not in the least said sir john breakfast is my sole free time in another half hour i assure you i shall be attending to three or four things at once he leant over towards edward henry but between you and me alderman quite privately if it isn't a rude question what did you come for well said edward henry as i wrote on my card i'm the sole proprietor of the regent theatre but there is no regent theatre sir john interrupted him no not strictly but there will be it's in course of construction we're up to the first floor dear me a suburban theatre no doubt do you mean to say sir john cried edward henry that you haven't noticed it it's within a few yards of piccadilly circus really said sir john you see my theatre is in lower regent street and i never go to piccadilly circus i make a point of not going to piccadilly circus miss taft how long is it since i went to piccadilly circus forgive me young woman i was forgetting you aren't old enough to remember well never mind details and what is there remarkable about the regent theatre elderman i intended to be a theatre of the highest class sir john said edward henry nothing but the very best will be seen on its boards that's not remarkable elderman we're all like that haven't you noticed it then secondly said edward henry i am the sole proprietor i have no financial backers no mortgages no partners i have made no contracts with anybody that said sir john is not unremarkable in fact many persons who do not happen to possess my own robust capacity for belief might not credit your statement and thirdly said edward henry every member of the audience even in the boxes the most expensive seats will have a full view of the whole of the stage or in the alternative at matinees a full view of a lady's hat alderman said sir john gravely before i offer you another egg let me warn you against carrying remarkableness too far you may be regarded as eccentric if you go on like that some people i am told don't want a view of the stage then they had better not come to my theatre said edward henry all which commented sir john gives me no clue whatever to the reason why you are sitting here by my side and calmly eating my eggs and toast and drinking my coffee admittedly edward henry was nervous admittedly he was a provincial in the presence of one of the most illustrious personages of the empire 
nevertheless he controlled his nervousness and reflected nobody else from the five towns would or could have done what i am doing moreover this chap is a mounty bank in the five towns they would kowtow to him but they would laugh at him they would mighty soon add him up why should i be nervous i'm as good as he is he finished with the thought which has inspired many a timid man with new courage in a desperate crisis the fellow can't eat me then he said aloud i want to ask you a question sir john one one are you the head of the theatrical profession or is sir gerald pompey sir gerald pompey sir gerald pompey haven't you seen the papers this morning sir john pilgrim turned pale springing up he seized the topmost of an undisturbed pile of daily papers and feverishly opened it bah he muttered he was continually thus imitating his own behaviour on the stage the origin of his renowned breakfasts lay in the fact that he had once played the part of a millionaire ambassador who juggled at breakfast with his own affairs and the affairs of the world the stage breakfast of a millionaire ambassador created by a playwright on the verge of bankruptcy had appealed to his imagination and influenced all the mornings of his life they've done it just to irritate me as i'm starting off on my world's tour he muttered coursing round the table then he stopped and gazed at edward henry this is a political knighthood said he it has nothing to do with the stage it is not like my knighthood is it certainly not edward henry agreed but you know how people will talk sir john people will be going about this very morning and saying that sir gerald is at last the head of the theatrical profession i came here for your authoritative opinion i know you're unbiased sir john resumed his chair as for pompey's qualifications as a head he murmured i know nothing of them i fancy his heart is excellent i only saw him twice once in his own theatre and once in bond street i should be inclined to say that on the stage he looks more like a gentleman than any gentleman ought to look and that in the street he might be mistaken for an actor how will that suit you it's a clue said edward henry alderman exclaimed sir john i believe that if i didn't keep a firm hand on myself i should soon begin to like you have another cup of coffee chung good-bye bootmaker good-bye i only want to know for certain who is the head said edward henry because i mean to invite the head of the theatrical profession to lay the cornerstone of my new theatre ah when do you start on your world's tour sir john i leave tilbury with my entire company scenery and effects on the morning of tuesday week by the kandahar i shall play first in cairo how awkward said edward henry i meant to ask you to lay the stone on the very next afternoon wednesday that is indeed yes sir john the ceremony will be a very original affair very original a foundation stone laying mused sir john but if you're already up to the first floor how can you be laying the foundation stone on wednesday week i didn't say foundation stone i said cornerstone edward henry corrected him an entire novelty that's why we can't be ready before wednesday week and you want to advertise your house by getting the head of the profession to assist that is exactly my idea well said sir john whatever else you may lack mr alderman you are not lacking in nerve if you expect to succeed in that edward henry smiled i have already heard in a roundabout way he replied that sir gerald pompey would not be unwilling to officiate my only difficulty is that i'm a truthful man by nature whoever officiates i shall of course have to have him labelled in my own interests as the head of the theatrical profession and i don't want to say anything that isn't true there was a pause now sir john couldn't you stay a day or two longer in london and join the ship at marseilles instead of going on board at tilbury but i have made all my arrangements the whole world knows that i am going on board at tilbury 
just then the door opened and a servant announced mr carlo trent sir john pilgrim rushed like a locomotive to the threshold and seized both carlo trent's hands with such a violence of welcome that carlo trent's eye-glass fell out of his eye and the purple ribbon dangled to his waist come in come in said sir john and begin to read at once i've been looking out of the window for you for the last quarter of an hour alderman this is mr carlo trent the well-known dramatic poet trent this is one of the greatest geniuses in london ah you know each other it's not surprising no don't stop to shake hands sit down here trent sit down on this chair here snip take his hat worry it worry it now trent don't read to me it might make you nervous and hurried read to miss taft and chung and to mr givington over there imagine that they are the great and enlightened public you have imagination haven't you being a poet sir john had accomplished the change of mood with the rapidity of a transformation scene in which form of art by the way he was a great adept carl trent somewhat breathless took a manuscript from his pocket opened it and announced the orient pearl oh breathed edward henry for some thirty minutes edward henry listened to hexameters the first he had ever heard the effect of them on his moral organism was worse even than he had expected he glanced about at the other auditors givington had opened a box of tubes and was spreading colours on his palate the china man's eyes were closed while his face still grinned snip was asleep on the parquet miss taft bit the end of a pencil with her agreeable teeth sir john pilgrim lay at full length on a sofa occasionally lifting his legs edward henry despaired of help in his great need but just as his desperation was becoming too acute to be borne carlo trent ejaculated the word curtain it was the first word that edward henry had clearly understood that's the first act said carlo trent wiping his face snip awakened edward henry rose and in the hush tiptoed round the sofa good-bye sir john he whispered you're not going i am sir john the head of his profession sat up how right you are said he how right you are trent i knew from the first words it wouldn't do it lacks colour i want something more crimson more like the brighter parts of this jacket something he waved hands in the air the alderman agrees with me he's going don't trouble to read any more trent but drop in any time any time chung what o'clock is it it is nearly noon said edward henry in the tone of an old friend well i'm sorry you can't oblige me sir john i'm off to see sir gerald pompey now but who says i can't oblige you protested sir john who knows what sacrifices i would not make in the highest interests of the profession alderman you jump to conclusions with the agility of an acrobat but they are false conclusions miss taft the telephone chung my coat good-bye trent good-bye an hour later edward henry met mr marrier at the grand babylon hotel well sir said mr marrier you are the greatest man that ever lived why mr marrier showed him the stop press news of a penny evening paper which read sir john pilgrim has abandoned his ceremonious departure from tilbury in order to lay the cornerstone of the new regent theatre on wednesday week he and miss cora pride will join the kandahar at marseilles you needn't do any advertising said mr marrier pilgrim will do all the advertising for you three edward henry and mr marrier worked together admirably that afternoon on the arrangements of the corner stone lane and such was the interaction of their separate enthusiasms it soon became apparent that all london in the only right sense of the word all must and would be at the ceremony characteristically mr marrier happened to have a list or catalogue of all london in his pocket and edward henry appreciated him more than ever but towards four o'clock mr marrier annoyed and even somewhat alarmed edward henry by a mysterious change of mien his assured optimism slipped away from him he grew uneasy darkly preoccupied 
and inefficient at last when the clock in the room struck four and edward henry failed to hear it mr marrier said i'm afraid i shall have to ask you to excuse me now why i told you i had an appointment for tea at four did you what is it edward henry demanded with an employer's instinctive assumption that souls as well as brains can be bought for such sums as three pounds a week i have a lady coming to tea here that is downstairs in this hotel yes who is it edward henry pursued lightly for though he appreciated mr marrier he also despised him however he found the grace to add may one ask it's miss elsie april do you mean to say marrier complained edward henry that you've known miss elsie april all these months and never told me there are two i suppose it's the cousin or something of rose euclid mr marrier nodded the fact is he said she and i are joint honorary organizing secretaries for the annual conference of the azure society you know it leads the new thought movement in england you never told me that either didn't i sir i didn't think it would interest you besides both miss april and i are comparatively new members oh said edward henry with all the canny provincial's conviction of his own superior shrewdness and he repeated so as to intensify this conviction and impress it on others oh in the undergrowth of his mind was the thought how dare this man whose brains belong to me be the organizing secretary of something that i don't know anything about and don't want to know anything about yes said mr marrier modestly i say edward henry inquired warmly with an impulsive gesture who is she who is she repeated mr marrier blankly yes what does she do doesn't do anything said mr marrier very good amateur actress goes about a great deal her mother was on the stage married a wealthy wholesale corset maker who did miss april edward henry had a twinge no her mother both parents are dead and miss april has an income a considerable income what do you call considerable five or six thousand a year the deuce murmured edward henry may have lost a bit of it of course mr marrier hedged but not much not much well said edward henry smiling what about my tea am i to have tea all by myself will you come down and meet her mr marrier's expression approached the wistful well said edward henry it's an idea isn't it why should i be the only person in london who doesn't know miss elsie april it was ten minutes past four when they descended into the electric publicity of the grand babylon amid the music and the rattle of crockery and the gliding waiters and the large nodding hats that gathered more and more thickly round the tables there was no sign of elsie april she may have been and gone away again said edward henry apprehensive oh no she wouldn't go away mr marrier was positive in the tone of a man with an income of two hundred pounds a week he ordered a table to be prepared for three at ten minutes to five he said i hope she hasn't been and gone away again edward henry began to be gloomy and resentful the crowded and factitious gaiety of the place actually annoyed him if elsie april had been and gone away again he objected to such silly feminine conduct if she was merely late he equally objected to such unconscionable exactitude he blamed mr marrier he considered that he had the right to blame mr marrier because he paid him three pounds a week and he very badly wanted his tea then their four eyes which for forty minutes had scarcely left the entrance staircase were rewarded she came in furs gleaming white kid gloves gold chains a gold bag and a black velvet hat i'm not late am i she said after the introduction no they both replied and they both meant it for she was like fine weather the forty minutes of waiting were forgotten expunged from the records of time just as the memory of a month of rain is obliterated by one splendid sunny day for edward henry enjoyed the tea which was bad to an extraordinary degree he became uplifted in the presence of miss elsie april whereas mr marrier strangely drooped to still deeper depths of unaccustomed inert melancholy 
edward henry decided that she was every bit as piquant challenging and delectable as he had imagined her to be on the day when he ate an artichoke at the next table to hers at wilkins she coincided exactly with his remembrance of her except that she was now slightly more plump her contours were effulgent there was no other word beautiful she was not for she had a turned-up nose but what charm she radiated every movement and tone enchanted edward henry he was enchanted not at intervals by a chance gesture but all the time when she was serious when she smiled when she fingered her teacup when she pushed her furs back over her shoulders when she spoke of the weather when she spoke of the social crisis and when she made fun with a certain brief absence of restraint rather in her artichoke manner of making fun he thought and believed this is the finest woman i ever saw he clearly perceived the inferiority of other women whom nevertheless he admired and liked such as the countess of chell and lady waldo it was not her brains nor her beauty nor her stylishness that affected him no it was something mysterious and dizzying that resided in every particle of her individuality he thought i've often and often wanted to see her again and now i'm having tea with her and he was happy have you got that list mr marrier she asked in her low and thrilling voice so saying she raised her eyebrows in expectation a delicious effect especially behind her half-raised white veil mr marrier produced a document but that's my list said edward henry your list i'd better tell you mr marrier essayed a rapid explanation mr mackin wanted a list of the right sort of people to ask to the cornerstone laying of his theatre so i use this as a basis elsie april smiled again very good she approved what is your list marrier asked edward henry it was elsie who replied people to be invited to the dramatic soiree of the azure society we give six a year no title is announced nobody except a committee of three knows even the name of the author of the play that is to be performed everything is kept a secret even the author doesn't know that his play has been chosen don't you think it's a delightful idea an offspring of the new thought he agreed that it was a delightful idea shall i be invited he asked she answered gravely i don't know are you going to play in it she paused yes then you must let me come talking of plays he stopped he was on the edge of facetiously relating the episode of the orient pearl at sir john pilgrim's but he withdrew in time suppose that the orient pearl was the piece to be performed by the azure society it might well be it was in his opinion just the sort of play that that sort of society would choose nevertheless he was as anxious as ever to see elsie april act he really thought that she could and would transfigure any play even his profound scorn of new thought a subject of which he was entirely ignorant began to be modified and by nothing but the enchantment of the tone in which elsie april murmured the words azure society how soon is the performance he demanded wednesday week said she that's the very day of my cornerstone lane he said however it doesn't matter my little affair will be in the afternoon but it can't be said she solemnly it would interfere with us and we should interfere with it our annual conference takes place in the afternoon all london will be there said mr marrier rather shamefaced that's just it mr machin it positively never occurred to me that the azure conference is to be on that very day i never thought of it until nearly four o'clock and then i scarcely knew how to explain it to you i really don't know how it escaped me mr marrier's trouble was now out he had declined in edward henry's esteem mr marrier was afraid of him mr marrier's list of personages was no longer a miracle of foresight it was a mere coincidence he doubted if mr marrier was worth even three pounds a week edward henry began to feel ruthless napoleonic he was capable of brushing away the whole azure society and new thought movement into limbo 
you must please alter your date said elsie april and she put her right elbow on the table and leaned her chin on it and thus somehow established a domestic intimacy for the three amid all the blare and notoriety of the vast tea-room oh but i can't he said easily familiarly it was her occasional artichoke manner that had justified him in assuming this tone i can't he repeated i've told sir john i can't possibly be ready any earlier and on the day after he'll almost certainly be on his way to marseilles besides i don't want to alter my date my date is in the papers by this time you've already done quite enough harm to the movement as it is said elsie april stoutly but ravishingly me harm to the movement haven't you stopped the building of our church oh so you know mr Rissell very well indeed anybody else would have done the same in my place edward henry defended himself your cousin miss euclid would have done it and marrier here was in the affair with her ah exclaimed elsie april but we didn't belong to the movement then we didn't know come now mr machin sir john pilgrim will of course be a great show but even if you've got him and managed to stick to him we should beat you you'll never get the audience you want if you don't change from wednesday week after all the number of people who count in london is very small and we've got nearly all of them you've no idea i won't change from wednesday week said edward henry this defiance of her put him into an extremely agitated felicity now my dear mr machin he was actually aware of the charm she was exerting and yet he discovered that he could easily withstand it now my dear miss april please don't try to take advantage of your beauty she sat up she was apparently measuring herself and him then you won't change the day truly her urbanity was in no wise impaired i won't he laughed lightly i dare say you aren't used to people like me miss april she might get the better of seven sacks but not of him edward henry much in from the five towns marrier said he suddenly with a bluff humorous downrightness you know you're in a very awkward position here and you know you've got to see alloyd for me before six o'clock be off with you i will be responsible for miss april i'll show these londoners he said to himself it's simple enough when you once get into it and he did in fact succeed in dismissing mr marrier after the latter had talked azure business with miss april for a couple of minutes i must go too said elsie imperturbable impenetrable one moment he entreated and masterfully signalled marrier to depart after all he was paying the fellow three pounds a week she watched marrier thread his way out already she had put on her gloves i must go she repeated her rich red lips then closed definitely have you a motor here edward henry asked no then if i may i'll see you home you may she said gazing full at him whereby he was somewhat startled and put out of countenance five are we friends he asked roguishly i hope so she said with no diminution of her inscrutability they were in a taxicab rolling along the embankment towards the buckingham palace hotel where she said she lived he was happy why am i happy he thought what is there in her that makes me happy he did not know but he knew that he had never been in a taxicab or anywhere else with any woman half so elegant her elegance flattered him enormously here he was a provincial man of business ruffling it with the best of them and she was young in her worldly maturity was she twenty-seven she could not be more she looked straight in front of her faintly smiling yes he was fully aware that he was a married man he had a distinct vision of the angelic nelly of the three children and of his mother but it seemed to him that his own case differed in some very subtle and yet effective manner from the similar case of any other married man and he lived unharassed by apprehensions in the lively joy of the moment but she said i hope you won't come to see me act why because i should prefer you not to you would not be sympathetic to me oh yes i should i shouldn't feel it so 
and then with a swift disarrangement of all the folds of her skirt she turned and faced him mr mackin do you know why i've let you come with me because you're a good-natured woman he said she grew even graver shaking her head no i simply wanted to tell you that you've ruined rose my cousin miss euclid me ruined miss euclid yes you robbed her of her theatre her one chance he blushed excuse me he said i did no such thing i simply bought her option from her she was absolutely free to keep the option or let it go the fact remains said elsie april with humid eyes the fact remains that she'd set her heart on having that theatre and you failed her at the last instant and she has nothing and you've got the theatre entirely in your own hands i'm not so silly as to suppose that you can't defend yourself legally but let me tell you that rose went to the united states heartbroken and she's playing to empty houses there empty houses whereas she might have been here in london interested in her theatre and preparing for a successful season i'd no idea of this breathed edward henry he was dashed i'm awfully sorry yes no doubt but there it is silence fell he knew not what to say he felt himself in one way innocent but he felt himself in another way blackly guilty his remorse for the telephone trick which he had practised on rose euclid burst forth again after a long period of quiescence simulating death and actually troubled him no he was not guilty he insisted in his heart that he was not guilty and yet and yet no taxicab ever travelled so quickly as that taxicab before he could gather together his forces it had arrived beneath the awning of the buckingham palace hotel his last words to her were now i shan't change the day of my stone lane but don't worry about your conference you know it'll be perfectly all right he spoke archly with a brave attempt at cajolery but in the recesses of his soul he was not sure that she had not defeated him in this their first encounter however seven sacks might talk as he chose she was not such a pervasive creature as all that she had scarcely even tried to be persuasive at about a quarter past six when he saw his underling again he said to mr marrier marrier i've got a great idea we'll have that cornerstone laying at night after the theatres say half-past eleven torchlight fireworks from the cranes it'll tickle old pilgrim to death i shall have a marquee with match boarding sides fixed up inside and heat it with a few of those smokeless stoves we can easily lay on electricity it will be absolutely the most sensational stone laying that ever was it'll be in all the papers all over the blessed world think of it torches fireworks from the cranes but i won't change the day neither for miss april nor anybody else mr marrier dissolved in laudations well edward henry agreed with false diffidence it'll knock spots off some of em in this town he felt that he had snatched victory out of defeat but the next moment he was capable of feeling that elsie april had defeated him even in his victory anyhow she was a most disconcerting and fancy monopolizing creature there was one source of unsullied gratification he had shaved off his beard six come up here sir john edward henry called you'll see better and you'll be out of the crowd and i'll show you something he stood in a fur coat at the top of a short flight of rough surface steps between two unplastered walls a staircase which ultimately was to form part of an emergency exit from the dress circle of the regent theatre sir john pilgrim also in a fur coat stood near the bottom of the steps with a glare of a well's light full on him and throwing his shadow almost up to edward henry's feet around edward henry could descry the vast mysterious forms of the building skeleton black in places but in other places lit up by bright rays from the gaiety below and showing glimpses of that gaiety in the occasional revelation of a woman's cloak through slits in the construction high overhead two gigantic cranes interlaced their arms and even higher than the cranes shone the stars of the clear spring night 
the hour was nearly half past twelve the ceremony was concluded and successfully concluded all london had indeed been present half the aristocracy of england and far more than half the aristocracy of the london stage the entire preciosity of the metropolis journalists with influence enough to plunge the whole of europe into war in one short hour edward henry's right hand peeping out from the superb fur coat which he had had the wit to buy had made the acquaintance of scores upon scores of the most celebrated right hands in britain he had the sensation that in future whenever he walked about the best streets of the west end he would be continually compelled to stop and chat with august and renowned acquaintances and that he would always be taking off his hat to fine ladies who flashed by nodding from powerful motor-cars indeed edward henry was surprised at the number of famous people who seemed to have nothing to do but attend advertising rituals at midnight or thereabouts sir john pilgrim had as marrier predicted attended to the advertisements but edward henry had helped and on the day itself the evening newspapers had taken the bit between their teeth and run off with the affair at a great pace the affair was on all the contents bills hours before it actually happened edward henry had been interviewed several times and had rather enjoyed that gradually he had perceived that his novel idea for a cornerstone laying had caught the facile imagination of the london populace for that night at least he was famous as famous as anybody sir john had made a wondrous picturesque figure of himself as in a raised corner of the crowded and beflagged marquee he had flourished a trowel and talked about the great and enlightened public and about the highest function of the drama and about the duty of the artist to elevate and about the solemn responsibility of theatrical managers and about the absence of petty jealousies in the world of the stage everybody had vociferously applauded while reporters turned rapidly the pages of their notebooks Ass edward henry had said to himself with much force and sincerity meaning sir john but he too had vociferously applauded for he was from the five towns and in the five towns people are like that then sir john had declared the corner stone well and truly laid it was on the corner which the electric sign of the future was destined to occupy and after being thanked had wandered off shaking hands here and there absently to arrive at length in the office of the clerk of the works where edward henry had arranged suitably to refresh the stone layer and a few choice friends of both sexes he had hoped that elsie april would somehow reach that little office but elsie april was absent indisposed her absence made the one blemish on the affair's perfection elsie april it appeared had been struck down by a cold which had entirely deprived her of her voice so that the performance of the azure society's dramatic club so eagerly anticipated by all london had had to be postponed edward henry bore the misfortune of the azure society with stoicism but he had been extremely disappointed by the invisibility of elsie april at his stone laying his eyes had wanted her sir john awakening apparently out of a dream when edward henry had summoned him twice climbed the uneven staircase and joined his host and youngest rival on the insecure planks and gangways that covered the first floor of the regent theatre come higher said edward henry mounting upward to the beginnings of the second story above which hung suspended from the larger crane the great cage that was employed to carry brick and stone from the ground the two fur coats almost mingled well young man said sir john pilgrim your troubles will soon be beginning now edward henry hated to be addressed as young man especially in the patronizing tone which sir john used moreover he had a suspicion that in sir john's mind was the illusion that sir john alone was responsible for the creation of the regent theatre 
that without sir john's aid as a stone layer it could never have existed you mean my troubles as a manager said edward henry grimly in twelve months from now before i come back from my world's tour you'll be ready to get rid of this thing on any terms you will be wishing that you had imitated my example and kept out of piccadilly circus piccadilly circus is sinister my alderman sinister come up into the cage sir john said edward henry you'll get a still better view rather fine isn't it even from here he climbed up into the cage and helped sir john to climb and standing there in the immediate silence sir john murmured with emotion we are alone with london edward henry thought cuckoo they heard footsteps resounding on loose planks in a distant corner who's there edward henry called only me replied a voice nobody takes any notice of me who is it muttered sir john alloyd the architect edward henry answered and then calling out come up here alloyd the muffled and coated figure approached hesitated and then joined the other two in the cage let me introduce mr alloyd the architect sir john pilgrim said edward henry ah said sir john bending towards alloyd are you the genius who draws those amusing little lines and scrawls on transparent paper mr alloyd tell me are they really necessary for a building or do you only do them for your own fun quite between ourselves you know i've often wondered said mr alloyd with a pale smile of course everyone looks on the architect as a joke the pause was somewhat difficult you promised us rockets mr mackin said sir john my mind yearns for rockets right you are edward henry complied close by but somewhat above them was the crane engine manned by an engineer whom edward henry was paying for overtime a signal was given and the cage containing the proprietor and the architect of the theatre and sir john pilgrim bounded most startlingly up into the air simultaneously it began to revolve rapidly on its cable as such cages will whether filled with bricks or with celebrities oh ejaculated sir john terror-struck clinging hard to the side of the cage oh ejaculated mr alloyd also clinging hard i want you to see london said edward henry who had been through the experience before the wind blew cold above the chimneys the cage came to a standstill exactly at the peak of the other crane london lay beneath the trio the curves of regent street and of shaftesbury avenue the right lines of piccadilly lower regent street and coventry street were displayed at their feet as on an illuminated map over which crawled mannequins and toy auto buses at their feet a long procession of automobiles were sliding off one after another with guests of the evening the metropolis stretched away lifting to the north and sinking to the south into jewelled river on whose curved banks rose messages of light concerning whiskey tea and beer the peaceful nocturnal roar of the city dwindling every moment now reached them like an emanation from another world you asked for a rocket sir john said edward henry you shall have it he had taken a box of fuses from his pocket he struck one and his companions in the swaying cage now saw that a tremendous rocket was hung to the peak of the other crane he lighted the fuse an instant of deathly suspense and then with a terrific and a shattering bang and sputter the rocket shot towards the kingdom of heaven and there burst into a vast dome of red blossoms which irradiating a square mile of roofs descended slowly and softly on the west end like a benediction you always want crimson don't you sir john said edward henry and the easy cheeriness of his voice gradually tranquillized the alarm natural to two very earthly men who for the first time found themselves suspended insecurely over a gulf i have seen nothing so impressive since the russian ballet murmured mr alloyd recovering you ought to go to siberia alloyd said edward henry sir john pilgrim 
pretending now to be extremely brave suddenly turned on edward henry and in a convulsive grasp seized his hand my friend he said hoarsely a thought has just occurred to me you and i are the two most remarkable men in london he glanced up as the cage trembled how thin that steel rope seems the cage slowly descended with many twists edward henry said not a word he was too deeply moved by his own triumph to be able to speak who else but me he reflected exultant could have managed this affair as i've managed it did anyone else ever take sir john pilgrim up into the sky like a load of bricks and frighten his life out of him as the cage approached the platforms of the first story he saw two people waiting there one he recognized as the faithful harmless marrier the other was a woman someone here wants you urgently mr mackin cried marrier by jove exclaimed alloyd under his breath what a beautiful figure no girl as attractive as that ever wanted me urgently some folks do have luck the woman had moved a little away when the cage landed edward henry followed her along the planking it was elsie april i thought you were ill in bed he breathed astounded her answering voice reached him scarcely audible i'm only hoarse my cousin rose has arrived to-night in secret at tilbury by the minnetonka the minnetonka he muttered staggering coincidence mystic heralding of misfortune i was sent for the pale ghost of a delicate voice continued she's broken ruined no courage left awful fiasco in chicago she's hiding now at a little hotel in soho she absolutely declined to come to my hotel i've done what i could for the moment as i was driving by here just now i saw the rocket and i thought of you i thought you ought to know it i thought it was my duty to tell you she held her muff to her mouth she seemed to be trembling a heavy hand was laid on his shoulder excuse me sir said a strong rough voice are you the gent that fired off the rocket it's against the law to do that kind o thing here and you ought to know it i shall have to trouble you it was a policeman of the c division sir john was disappearing with his stealthy and conspiratorial air down the staircase End of chapter seven